Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt alongside with you as always for Fireside Chat. And before we get started tonight, we should address probably the biggest Flames news of the week. And that's the fact that Johnny Goudreau will not be playing with the Calgary Flames tonight in L.A. He's gone home to New Jersey to be with his father, Guy Goudreau, who suffered a cardiac event on March 25th. So our thoughts and prayers here at Fireside Chat are with Johnny and his family, and we hope that everything's fine and uh, Guy will be able to get through this one. Yeah, and hopefully he's got medical treatment right away, and uh, they are doing very good things with hearts nowadays. It's not like before where it was, you know, it's not very good. So hopefully he uh, is okay, and everybody in the Gaudreau family is all right and hopefully things get better and everybody is happy in their family eventually and not having to deal with more serious issues or anything like that you know and and what a good organization i guess if this has to happen to somebody because as we know the calgary flames have always been family first they've always been about their players and about the you know the guys in the dressing room and even if you listen to the quotes from the players on the Flames website everyone really looks at this as part of their extended family which is awesome yeah and I I just hope that everybody is doing all right in the Flames organization and because of how close-knit everybody is with each other and that everybody's okay and but I hope that Guy gets better soon and or Guy I don't I'm not sure how you pronounce it. probably not French it's an American yeah so either way And, you know, I guess if there's a time we have to lose Johnny, what a better time than now, right? I mean, the Flames are out of this. It's not going to affect us that much, and it might allow some guys to step up. Yeah, exactly. uh, The Flames are basically just playing right now. I wouldn't even say for pride because, you know, that that disappeared a long time ago. Uh, Speaking of pride disappearing, should we talk about the last two games? Yeah. What a great week of Flames hockey, I tell you. Last week on uh, Wednesday night, the Calgary Flames were back home taking on the Anaheim Ducks. And as usual, I thought came out, played okay, had better quality shots against the Ducks in the first period. But as always, um, let the game get away from them against a very skilled team. And the Ducks ended up winning this one 4 nothing. Yeah, there's not really much you can say. Like, the Flames are their compete level. Like, they're getting shots, and they're getting decent shots from decent areas. It's just that, for whatever reason, none of it's translating. The flame shooting percentage is abysmally low. Uh, They have the most missed shots of any team in the league this season. And it's just... it, It is hard to understand with the talent that they have and the opportunities that they get that they're this bad because of the fact that uh, like this is a game that uh, once it got up to two nothing and then eventually three nothing like you knew that the game was over but it shouldn't have gotten to that point based on and i thought the flames played well in the first and probably the second the first half of the second no and it it, that's what i mean like they under normal circumstances like this probably would have been like a 2-2 game or a 3-2 for Calgary at the point when the Flames just stopped playing and like it does defies logic on why this keeps happening where this team they're doing all the things that they need to except for putting the puck in the net and I know personnel wise that they need more shooters because most of the team is a bunch of playmakers they don't have really anybody with that Jerome Aginla type architect of uh, shoot first and they just don't have that like Monaghan's probably the closest to that player in the organization and even he's not anything like that either and that's going to be one of the main obstacles that the management's going to have to address in the offseason is finding some shooters that can actually it it almost is to the point where it really doesn't matter if the rest of their game is mediocre they need guys who can score goals and 
I don't know how that gets accomplished without... Why get a Jerome McGinley type player? Jerome McGinley is available. Well, we want NHL caliber players. And at this bring point, Daryl back, bring Jerome back. It can be like 2004 all over again. Yeah, get Regeer out and get Rhett Warner off the radio. And Gibber's not doing anything. Yeah. Bring the band Jelena's back together. probably going to be out of a job at the end of the year. Yeah. So... Um, interesting roster moves here. The Flames saw Christopher Stieg scratched, and they had a wide variety of forwards to choose from. Nick Shore, Chris Stewart, Tanner Glass. They went with Glass. Well, that makes some sense, just due to the fact that the Ducks are, frankly, a dick team, and they will agitate and fight. So it makes sense to have a deterrent in the lineup. You could have gotten more or less the same thing from Stewart, but... Yeah, it is what it is. And another player that we saw, uh, we haven't we haven't seen a lot of for the Flames this year, was number fifty-four, Rasmus Anderson. I thought Anderson played, by all accounts, a really good game. I thought he had a really good first period. As I mean, the Flames started to lose things. Raz was less noticeable, but especially that first period, I really liked what we saw. I know, and th- this is where it makes it almost necessary for the Flames to deal a defenseman in the offseason. It's not because, oh, let's get rid of whomever for because they're bad. It's just you, the fact is is that Anderson is NHL ready. Kulak is NHL ready. And both of them can play at a higher level than I think that their current roles dictate. And I think that if you have Shillington progress at all, or Valimaki progress at all, then you're, you're going to need to make spots, and currently there are none. So it, it almost becomes necessary to do that in order to grow the organization a bit. And but that's what you want. You want to be able to move veterans, bring in young guys, and I mean have those pieces you can move, because most teams that are built like the Flames, don't have a lot of pieces they'd be willing to move. Yeah, and it, this team currently kind of reminds me of Nashville from about two, three years ago when they had Weber and uh, guys like Seth Jones and they had other players like Matthias Eckholm who he was their 6'7 defenseman and they had to move somebody to make room and they eventually dealt Seth Jones to get Ryan Johansson killing two birds at one stone by freeing up the roster spot so that way Ekholm could emerge into being a quality top four defenseman. And it allowed them to address the dire need that they had for a first line center. And the Flames are in that same sort of situation where we desperately need somebody who can put the puck in the net. Hey, we have a bunch of good defensemen one can feed the other and I think that that will be imperative in this offseason to help address the situation because of the fact you look at Gaudreau having basically being one of the top 10 players in the NHL and that's with one first line player and arguably a third line player if you had somebody that was a legitimate first line shooter like, that player could probably score 30 to 40 goals, e- probably easily, and it would help to spread the wealth through the lineup because Furland could probably pop 15 in if he's playing on the second or third line because he still has his shot, and it, it won't just magically go away. It's just that the Flames need more from that first line spot whether Gaudreau flips over to the right side and you get a left winger in or you get a right winger in. Either way, the Flames just need somebody because, yeah. Well, the next game this week, the Flames went back on the road to San Jose, and I think this was a a good showing from the team that I could say probably won the trade deadline already, and that's the acquisition of Evander Kane by the Sharks. He's looked good in both games against the Flames since the acquisition, and uh, Flames again lose a big one, five-one loss over the Sharks. Yeah, and another game where Corsi fans seemingly disappear. The Flames, you know, according to all the advanced statistics, should have won most of the games lately, and yet, nope. 
And it's kind of interesting how those the people that pro prop those stats up seem to have gone quiet all of a sudden. You know, there's a place for advanced stats, but like anything, I think that um, sometimes people use them almost as a justification for things, and then when they go away, it's like, okay, now the one thing I was basing my whole opinion on doesn't say it anymore, and I have nothing else to say. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to make a part of a conversation of, look, here's this other metric that also says, but when your whole, I, I think there's been this movement towards advanced stats, advanced stats, advanced stats. I call it money ball hockey. Everyone's looking at the numbers and trying to find the, you know, the metric to tell them who's good. And to me, it's only one part of the picture. Yeah, exactly. It's not like baseball where there's uh, uh, like basically one defined event. The pitcher throws the ball, whether the batter hits it or doesn't or whatever like there's only so many different things that can happen based off of that the hockey is too fluid of a thing to pinpoint it's this one specific thing that makes everything go and that's part of the reason why i've been critical of advanced statistics for years just because of the fact that it hockey is a lot more complex and hard to pinpoint to the spe specificity that would be needed to have something that gives you direct correlation and causation whereas with the Corsi and all that it it's very much a crapshoot like yeah good teams tend to have better scoring chances but it, that doesn't necessarily yeah anyway rant I shouldn't say who because I don't know if you'd want me to say his name but I've been talking to a couple of scouts up in the press box lately and a few of them said, you know what, if advanced stats told the whole story, I'd be out of a job. We just run a computer, tell us who to draft, who to trade for, all those sort of things. He said the biggest thing is still the eye test. What does it look like when a, you know, someone who understands the game goes and watches the player? Yeah, exactly. Because how do you say, like, when I look at players uh, going on a little bit of an off tangent, when I'm looking at players uh, for, like, our dr draft recap show or preview shows and that, like, I... I'm assuming that, like, all the players that are rated are, have a general idea what end of the stick is up. So you're looking for things that are different about the player. And, like, do they comprehend the game at a different level and do odd things that are not typical? And that's where, like, the eye test comes in because, like, you look at two players and, like, say they have 60 points in the same league and are roughly the same size, but it's how you get them that matters. And, you know, it, there's those little differences, and I, that's part of where the advanced statistics, it, it, you can't differentiate that. It's, it's sort of like when you look at Gaudreau. Like, he sees things on the ice where you just can't pick it apart. Like, he, he is thinking the game at a different level, and it... Yet you look at, like, oh, his size and all that. Well, of course, no. But, you know, it's that other that is the important thing. And I don't think that the stats reflect that other thing. No, I think you're right. Well, Matt, with Goudreau out, we know that Monaghan is out. Uh, we know that Kachuk is out. I mean, the, those kind of names, you wonder what's the Flames lineup going to look like tonight in L.A. and going forward. Let me read to you the lineup that we saw based on the lines of practice today at the Staples Center, and you give me your reactions, okay? Sure. First line, the, you know, the first line is the most important line for any team. Michael Froelich, Michael Backlund, Troy Brower. Uh, is this the first game of uh, training camp where you got like eight rookies in there and and a, it's a road like, game <laughs> that's like the first line of my the guy in my office pool who didn't show up on the draft day and the computer so assigned him whoever's left <laughs> yeah that's line, not good line two Sam Bennett Nick Shore Curtis Lazar yeah if that we'll was the fourth if... line then that'd be fine but it's it's a line of guys who need to live up to their potential. Like maybe tonight they can all live up to their potential together. Now watch once this game's actually over, the Flames will probably end up winning like five to one, just to be complete contrarian a holes about things. 
Line three, Michael Furland on the left, Mark Jankowski down the middle, and Chris Stewart on the right. I feel sorry for Jankowski. Yeah, not really. It, that that line could... If we're going to score tonight, that'll be the line that does it. I think Janko's going to do all the scoring on that line, and then the other two guys are going to be his setup men. Yeah. And the last line, the fourth line for the forwards, Tanner Glass, Matt Stage, and Garnett Hathaway. Rock'em, sock'em. I, I think you can just already pencil the two points. Yeah, I think you can point, put the two points in the the win column for L.A. before the game just starts. This is one of those things where if you're L.A., do you say, you know what, let's just set our guys too and we can probably still win this one. Yeah. Oh, they need the points. Calgary, eh, they're done, so... And then, well, we're still talking about this week, a roster transaction that was made. The Calgary Flames sent David Riddick back to Stockton and called up John Gillies. And I think this is probably nothing more than if they think Riddick is the better goalie, they're trying to get Stockton into the playoffs and sending Riddick down to do that. Yeah, and that it, it, why not at this point? It's interesting that uh, Spencer Foos hit the 20-goal mark in Stockton, so... He's, after having a slow start, is looking like more of the NHL-ready, potentially, prospect that he was when we first signed him. So hopefully he can continue having some good games down the stretch. And if maybe the Flames might recall him for a game at the end of the year. Well, I was going to be my question to you. So the Flames have one recall left. For those that don't know, they get, what, a handful of recalls Four. after the trade deadline? Four. They've used three of them. Um, I think that with the with Stockton in a playoff potentially playoff position, I don't see them recalling anybody until Stockton clinches. You'd hate to say bring up a guy like Foo and then Stockton doesn't get the goals they need and doesn't get in. Yeah, exactly. And I think that once the the X is by their name and they're in, then I think the Flames will recall Foo because you look at all the other guys that they've recalled recently. It's all guys that they're trying to gauge whether they're they have NHL potential, whether it's Manjapane, Klimchuk, Hathaway, Jankowski. So with Fu having a very good, frankly, AHL rookie season, might as well give him a game at the end of the year just to see if he is ready for training camp and gives him some things to work on and all that kind of stuff. With Gillies coming up, um, I'm kind of surprised they're playing Smith tonight against L.A., but what do you think? We've got, what, five, six games left? How many do you think Gillies gets into? Probably three or four. Uh, I don't see any need, really, for Smith to play much down the no. stretch. And, and you, I think this also lets them observe you know, Gillies a little bit more. They've seen a lot of Riddick so far. Yeah, exactly, and it's better to have more of a book on Gillies and, like, I'm frankly hoping that the Flames do not trade Gillies or Riddick this offseason. I think it would be a mistake. Because we saw with Winnipeg, uh, Connor Hellebuck. And Hellebuck, for the first couple seasons, was frankly awful. And now he's not. And I think that the Flames have the potential of having three guys that could be top-notch goalies in the NHL. They just need the time to sort their game out at the NHL level to see whether or not they're actually starter material. And if the Flames are impatient with that, they might end up selling low on a very key asset to the organization. Yeah, I think, and I mean, we can talk more about this in future weeks as well, and we've talked about it in the past, but I think next year is going to be an interesting time for goaltending. Smith, I think, will be back. The backup goaltender is unknown. You can't really run the two up and down because of waivers, but uh, I think they're both waiver eligible next year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. So, you know, you've kind of got to pick one. And as much as I agree with you about selling, at the same time, you got to sell to get. And if that's what it takes to get one of the assets the Flames need, I am more excited about Tyler Parsons than I am about, say, David Riddick. So I'd be willing to, you know, sell something to get something knowing that oh, we still sure. got someone in the pipeline. If the only other goalie was Raymond and Schneider, or sorry, not Ray, Ray McDonald and Schneider, uh, I'd be a little worried. But I think with Parsons there, we can afford to move one of Gillies or Riddick. Yeah. And I'd hope it'd be Riddick, and that's no offense to him as a goalie. It's just I think Gillies is the better overall talented player. So... 
To me, from what we've seen this season, Gillies was able to step into the key games when you know he and Riddick were the the tandem, and he was able to play better in those key games. And to me, that's what you need to do as a backup. You got to be ready to go at you know any time you're called. Yeah. Well, Matt, I asked some fans today on Twitter on behalf of Fireside Chat, what do you want us to talk about tonight? The season's winding down, and overwhelmingly, what do you think the topic everyone wants to talk about is? Uh, the weather. Um, yes, it's springtime. Yes. That means hockey's over. Golf time. Yes. Something. After the weather, what do you think people want us to talk about? I have no idea what it could be. Perhaps I'll coaching. give you a hint. It's, it's not concession prices. Yeah. It is coaching. So we've talked a lot on the show. You've been critical of the coach in the past. Um, just, I guess, let's revisit this topic. Let's talk about a little bit of history of Flames coaching, and then I'll ask you some questions about the coaches. Sure thing. So I was pulling up today the list of coaches for the Calgary Flames, and since the team has been in Calgary, how many coaches do you think they've had? Probably close to 20. They've had 16 coaches, yeah. uh, full-time coaches. So even if we look at, I mean, since, let's just look back to 2000. I think for most fans, that's when they're going to remember we got a lot of younger fans, but since 2000, we've had Brian Sutter, Don Hay, Greg Gilbert, Al McNeil for 11 games as an interim coach, Daryl Sutter, Jim Playfair, Mike Keenan, Brent Sutter, Bob Hartley, Glenn Gullitson. Like this team changes coaches almost as much as you change your underwear. N- not, I wouldn't go that far. No. <laughs> um, no you know, but like it, uh, as a as a head coach. In, in, the flames. It makes you wonder if guys want to come to Calgary with how often they flip coaches. Well, part of the problem is that outside of Mike Keenan, Daryl Sutter, and Brent Sutter, the Flames have not really acquired any name guys. And the and even Keenan, I mean, I would say that by the time he was here, he's past his best before date. Oh, definitely. Like it, it wasn't Iron Mike; it was more like Kitten Mike. Um, Aluminum Mike. Yeah. It, it it's one of those things that the Flames uh, trying to catch lightning in a bottle by not spending very much on coaching staff personnel. And when it was early in the 2000s, that made sense because of the fact that, frankly, the Flames were a crap team and they uh, didn't have any money and that's part of the reason why the Flames were a bad team. And eventually they got Daryl Sutter in, and he did a very good job, got us to the Stanley Cup Finals, and then got promoted, and then they hired another chief coach, and that failed. And then the next coach failed, and then his brother, who was also an inexperienced head coach at the NHL level, failed. And and then you we got... We still have Dwayne, Ron, and Rich, who've not coached here. Should we call one of them in so we can complete the set? M- maybe. <laughs> Maybe you make them like three co-coaches and get you know get three for the price of one. Uh, but no, and then you look at Bob Hartley. He was out of the league for a bit and it was just basically looking for an NHL job. And so we got him at a discount, even though he had a decent pedigree. And then you have Glenn Gullitson, similarly was out of a job after only having one job at the NHL level. And yeah. So the Flames coaching staff, basically since you'd have to go pretty much all the way back to 89, have been less than good. And they haven't really spent, they've spent money on literally everything else except for a quality coach. And that's fine when your team is not expected to do anything. Like, you know, you can, when you, you were in the middle of the young guns era it wouldn't have mattered if you had scotty bowman as your coach the team was still going to be crap and so sure you can save some bucks then but as this team and i think that a good portion of the reason why the flames didn't do anything after the 04 cup run was due to the coaching staffs that's why like year in year out the players always were better on paper than the on ice results and i think that when you look at teams and how they're organized around the league usually the standings correlate to how good of a team is talent wise 
And when there's an odd deviation, like last year with the Oilers, or even this year with the Vegas Knights, that's usually due to an unusual factor with the team. And last year it was Cam Talbot being excellent for the Edmonton Oilers. I, in my opinion, he was the best goalie in the NHL last year. And this year, Gerard Gallant has done an excellent job with the Vegas Golden Knights. And if you look, when teams tend to underperform, it's usually there's only one reason, and that's for better or worse, just a not good overall coaching staff. And sometimes you, when you're at a point, you have to actually spend money to make money. And you look at the Toronto Maple Leafs, they actually did something different. They were starting a rebuild, and they went out and signed Babcock to a mega money, mega year deal because they knew that they weren't going to be in the rebuild forever and once they were done, they needed a good coach to get them through. And the Flames are out of that rebuild now. They need the same thing. You need different coaches for different times in your organization's career it's almost like a company with their with their ceo you see some companies that bring in a certain ceo when they're trying to stave off bankruptcy some that bring in a different ceo when they're going public different times of that business cycle you have different leaders and hockey's the same and i think we've seen a lot of coaches who've come up through the junior ranks for the flames like don hay gilbert guys like that because they were trying to get developmental coaches. And I think right now, if you're saying that this team is Stanley Cup ready, you need to bring in a guy who is proven he knows how to either win a Stanley Cup or coach a Stanley Cup contender. You can't be finding, you know, coaches like Gullitson, coaches like, you know, guys, even Dave Cameron, who only has 70 wins in the NHL. You've got to be bringing in a coach who has a track record that they know how to do this job. Yeah, because you look at the players or the coaches. And that's, I, th I think the question is, where do we get those yeah, guys? Yeah, well, you look at the coaches that are good, that they tend to be able to manage their players well. And, like, if you look at all the super teams that have been since the 90s when you had Sackick, Forsberg, and all that, Wah, and all that, or Iserman, Fedorov, Shanahan, et cetera, et cetera, the coaches understood how to manage everybody to get them on the same page even though like each of them had their own egos in the play and like even more currently like you have Kessel, Malkin and Crosby with Pittsburgh and you need good like yes you need good systems of course but you also need that on off ice managing as, just as much and I think that that's part of why the Flames have struggled so much is because they, the, they're they woefully inadequate in that regard and they need somebody to... I said to you in the past Matt I mean head coaching is partly the hockey partly the X's nose and partly it's being the human resources manager like you said knowing how to motivate and you know get the best out of all those guys in the dressing yeah, room yeah and like frankly most uh, NHL systems are generally the same like the 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 game hasn't changed that much over 50 years like it, it there's only so many ways to play yeah, hockey so it's the more important aspect of it is getting the most out of your players and like you look at a guy like dave tippett and i'm not saying that the flame should go and get him but you just as a recent example the coyotes were always terrible uh, like uh, since they had Kachuk and Ronick and Amante on their team, they've been terrible. And he was able to get the most out of all of the players in that organization for as long as possible. And like even though they've been terrible for years, it, they would have been worse had it not been for Tippett. And the Flames are not getting and haven't gotten that kind of thing other than from Bob Hartley and his shelf life was short just due to the fact that um, he was a little too abrasive and his system wasn't very good so let me ask you some questions Matt do you think the Calgary Flames whoever the let's start with this do you think that Glenn Gullitson is back next season 
I think Gullitson, it, as soon as game 82 is in the books, it, I don't think they'll, the Flames will go to the extent that the Panthers did and just leave them at the airport, but uh, I wouldn't uh, think it would be taking that much longer. I think that... W- well, considering game 82 is at home, they'd have to drive and especially the airport. Yeah, I, I just don't think that uh, that's... I, I don't see that being more than that day or the next day for him to get fired and honestly i don't see there's any r- rational or reasonable way- reason to keep him or any of the coaching staff on board because after his there's no point in getting rid of him before the end of the season let him play out the last six and yeah move on. and it, it's it is what it is and bad things happen it, you can't have a debacle a debacle of monumental proportions to quote uh, a certain oiler uh to and let them keep their job like this season was probably the worst season for the calgary flames based on the expectations in the entire franchise's history because this team was expected to be on the upswing and instead they regressed significantly for no real apparent reason so do you think that there's any coach the Calgary Flames could bring in next year who doesn't have, say, a Stanley Cup or two that we could probably justify as, you know what, this is the guy who's going to lead us to a Stanley Cup? The only guy that makes sense in my books would be Dave Tippett. And the it, it's not one of those situations where there's a bunch of good, young, upcoming goal, uh, coaches, period, at this point. I think that... Other than uh, Sullivan with Pittsburgh, the, I, I don't really see any candidates that jump out at me as, hey, this guy's really innovative or whatever. Like, everybody seems to be just, uh, just generically there. Yeah, I think there's some guys that are innovative, but again, they're younger guys who don't have a proven NHL track record, a guy like a Glenn Gullitson, perhaps. So I think we need to stay with known commodity names. And the thing I like about Tippett is even though he hasn't won a cup, he's played with a lot, or he's coached a lot of successful teams. I mean, you know, the Capitals, the Penguins, the Flyers recently, um, lots of, or those are teams he played with. And then he coached with LA, Dallas, Phoenix, like, you know, lots of NHL experience, both as a player and a coach. So that could yeah. make sense. And it's one of those situations where there is familiarity between him and the management structure so it could conceivably work but one doesn't know off ice friendships and such so it's kind of hard to tell whether or not there'd be friction there or whatever so we're becoming the arizona coyotes north well in some aspects that's a good thing other aspects not so good so because arizona is always a decent team that just had zero talent in the organization because of mostly because of financial constraints so you know when they did have some talent they went far and they almost got to the stanley cup finals that one year and they weren't a very good team and that was largely due to guys like Tippett and the current gm and uh i can't remember what maloney's job title is off the top of my head he was gm at the yeah. time wasn't he I, I was meaning True Living because he was there. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we know that your pick, I mean, you ranted back in December about the coach and you want the Flames to bring in Daryl Sutter. If not Daryl, who would your second pick be for well, that job? he's still under contract, but uh, Joel Quenville would be... Him or Daryl would be uh, perfectly fine in my books. Like, if Chicago does pull the trigger and fire Quenville, I think the Flames should be right there like that day here's a brinks truck come play for you know come coach us well i think that's one of the reasons you have to get rid of gullitson if you're going to right away after the season's done so that you don't have a head coach and whoever comes available you can sign them immediately Yeah, exactly and whether it costs six or seven million dollars to get a guy like quenville uh, realistically the flames are in a spot now where uh, they actually need to put up some money on the coaching staff to actually win and i think that if a guy like quenville comes available or even daryl like there's no problem with either they need to pony up 
the cash and actually go out and sign somebody that's more profiled than not. I agree. Um, my first choice, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of bringing Daryl back, but my first choice is Quenville. I can totally see him in Chicago parting ways. I think he does, probably doesn't want to be part of a rebuild, so I can see him you know, asking Chicago for his release. I think you could also get him a bit cheaper. I don't know how long he's under contract, but if he's being paid by two teams, you might be able to get him a bit cheaper as well. True. Uh, he's got three Stanley Cups and 880 NHL wins, which is, you know, a pretty winning yeah, coach. Yeah, well, he was very good with St. Louis as well. They just never could get over the hump. But uh, it, the main reason why earlier in the season I was advocating for Daryl was because of the fact that he was the best of what was available. And I, if I had to choose between them, I would take Quenville over Daryl, but, you know, one's available, one's not. So, we'll see. Another coach I can see losing his job, who I'd be okay bringing in, he wouldn't be my first choice, but that's Elaine Vino in uh, New York. I can see the Rangers parting with him, and again, a, a very yeah. proven NHL and, coach. And that was going to be my other alternate, would be Alan Vino. Let me run some names by you of other guys who are either unemployed or um, who maybe are employed by other teams but not in a head coaching role. And you let me know if you think any of these guys could be the next head coach. Um, a head coach who has 320 wins, one Stanley Cup, Dan Blysma. I wouldn't want him. I, I don't, I'm not a fan of his management style and I don't think that the Penguins won because of him as the coach I could see bringing him in in sort of an associate coach role if you want an experienced guy but I don't want him as the no. head coach and, and it's one of those things that those Penguins teams basically from 08 on uh, frankly with the quality of the teams uh, the Penguins should have two or three more cups than they do and I think partially that was Marc Andre Fleury imploding several times uh, in the playoffs, and I think the coaching staff was a little bit of a drawback there as well. So I wouldn't, he wouldn't be first on my list. I think if we go down to Blizma, it really makes you wonder: was there nobody else available? Yeah, exactly. A guy that I've always liked, and that's former Buffalo head coach Lindy Ruff. He's currently an assistant coach in New York. I think New York will make him the head coach if Vino gets canned, but might be. I mean, he's a guy with some head coaching experience. What'd you think of bringing yeah, Ruff in? Yeah, I'd be. I think that I agree with you that Ruff's likely the new head coach of the New York Rangers once they they move on from Vino. I don't see him becoming available just for that reason. If not, sure. I'd like him more than Blizma, Bi ah, but I just, eh. I'm not really a big fan of Lindy Ruff. Uh, he's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, he, I'm not overly excited. I think Lindy Ruff needs a strong staff around. Yeah, him. I'm not. I wouldn't be overly excited. Like he's a very experienced coach, but uh, those Buffalo teams always kind of underperformed with him, and. You know, it, he's just kind of wishy-washy. I, 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 I like him, but I, I wouldn't want him. Like, I wouldn't be like, oh, good, he's our coach. If the Flames hired him, like, it, it'd be like, oh, okay, uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I think he's probably capable of doing the job. But again, I would think if Lindy Ruff is the guy we end up with, it really makes you wonder. You know. What I guess what happened? Were all the other coaches snapped up? Is there a problem? Do guys not want to come to Calgary? Like, I would just kind of look at him as a fourth or yeah. fifth choice. Um, another guy, Michael Terrian, who's with uh, the Montreal Canadiens as a scout right now. He's had two tours of duty with the Habs. Not a guy I'd want to bring in here, but a guy who does have some head coaching yeah, experience. Zero. I'd rather have Bob Hartley come back or Brent Sutter or Mike Keenan. So anybody or but Keith him. Gullitson. Or go, you know, have one of the players act as the coach. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Stajan, he can retire and be the coach. Um, all right, one more name I'll give you. We've already talked about Tippett, but this is a guy who has 550 wins, won Stanley Cups. I didn't even know he was still around, but he's working with Dallas. Mark Crawford. 
uh, same situation with Ruff, where if he was hired, it'd be like, eh, okay, yeah, sure, why not? Like, yeah, he won a Stanley Cup with Colorado, but frankly, it, that year it was going to be either Detroit or Colorado winning the Cup, and the Stanley Cup final was really the Western Conference final that year. And, yeah, it... it when you have Wah, Sackick, and Forsberg on your team, like, it, you know, like, and they're in their prime, eh, give me a break. Like, the coach really, really does not matter at all. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, no, I can agree with that. And I don't think since that team, he's really had much. I mean, he's been floating around Europe. He's sort of like Hartley. I'm I'm not sure that he's got that proven track record we need yeah, at this point. Like, he's okay, but like that'd be an underwhelming choice. Like you might At that point, you might as well just go with some young upcoming guy that nobody's ever heard of. Yeah, no, I can, I can vouch for that. Um, so those are really, I think, the head coaching candidates you'll see. I don't think there's probably any other NHL head coach who's currently employed that I think you can almost be sure is going to be canned besides Quenville or Vino. Anyone you can think Not of? Not really. Uh, maybe McClellan from Edmonton. I think they might want to move away from him. Yeah, I don't want their sloppy seconds, yeah, though. I, yeah. Uh, I didn't think he was a very good coach when he was with the Sharks, and... I don't think he's a good coach with the Oilers. So, you know, I just, yeah, I'd rather not, period. So of that list, I guess my ordering, if I had to pick, would be uh, Quenville, then Vino, then Tippett. How about you? I'd put Daryl ahead of Vino, but uh, same order. I just don't think Daryl's coming No, back neither do I. I that ship yeah, neither do I. But if I was to, you know, starting fresh, you know, rank the four that would be my order i could see maybe bringing daryl in if he wanted to be like an associate coach that's always the name they give to the head head assistant but i just i don't know i think daryl's days as an angel head coach might be done yeah i think that he if he want i think with the two stanley cups in hand like if he doesn't want to do the work he doesn't have to so it it's is he motivated and if the flames can get him motivated then sure but i i don't see it happening either i think that the, i'm hoping for one of the three names that besides sutter anyway yeah and and like you were saying i think this is one of those times when the flames have to make a big splash they have to um move on from picking yeah. sort of mediocre cheap coaches and move on to picking you know, guys who are going to lead this team for long term and maybe spend that money, you know, make spend the long term money to get the coach you need. Yeah, and it, it, how would you say, with the hiring of Glenn Gullitson, it made sense at the time because you had a, a coach that led the Penguins to a Stanley Cup, you had his workmate in Vancouver available. They both have the same systems. It made sense at the time to try it. It failed, but, you know, and that happened. It's one of those things where it was the right decision to hire Glenn Gullitson. It just, it failed catastrophically. And now it's like, okay, we have to do something different now. And the Flames, after two years, are past that rebuild stage. They're in contender mode. And, yeah, the team isn't in the playoffs. And, yeah, that's unrealistic that they should be in contender mode. But they're in that phase. And they need somebody commiserate with that phase. And right now, Glenn Gullitson isn't that. So they need to make that modification to the organization and hopefully spend some money and get somebody good. So looking at the staff around Glenn Gulledson, Dave Cameron, Paul Gerard, Martin Jelena, Jordan Siglett, and Jamie Pringle, all the assistant coaches, this team has a weird tendency. We saw this too when Sutter came in, is they like to just give the coach assistance and not let the coach pick their own assistance. Um, from this team, anyone you could see sticking around? Yeah, I don't... Anyone you think should stick around? I'd get rid of everybody, frankly. And I'd like them to uh, spend some money, period, 
on all of the assistant coaches, including the goalie coach, and get higher quality play personnel, period. And, you know, maybe somebody that can run a power play where you have the defensemen where their sticks are on the center ice side at the blue lines so that they can actually one-time the puck. That's why the Flames' power play is like 3% since the February 25th. But, um, yeah, it's just one of those things where the Flames need a lot of better personnel, basically. All the way around. On ice, off ice, everything. They just need to get better. Yeah. I would like to see, I think, if any one of those three head coaches we mentioned, uh, Vino. Quenville or Tippett comes in, I, I would trust them to build their own team and that they'd put together a good team. Yeah, there. I, I agree. And I think that the Flames independently should hire their own goalie coach. And I think that they need to move on from Sigalette. Just, uh, just to, because they need to get... I think that there are better goalie coaches out there and I think that they should spend some money there. Especially when you have three really good top quality goalie prospects coming up I think it's more important to have somebody that could foster those guys into actually becoming top tier goalies I agree so Matt let me throw two names I was kind of thinking of what what could I see the Flames assistants looking like next year um, two names that I would see this team potentially going with tell me your thoughts I can see them promoting Ryan Huska from Stockton to be an assistant he's worked with a lot of the young kids he knows their tendencies I think it would be good to sort of graduate him as you're graduating your kids up yeah that, that could work and you know I'm not saying he's necessarily the future of the team but I think he's a good young coach who they they need to start promoting and you can find someone else there's a lot of good college coaches coaches in the CHL who could take on the AHL reins oh yeah for sure and that shouldn't be a problem and then another sort of experienced coach because I always figure you want sort of the grizzled veteran assistant coach would be Paul McLean Bringing Paul McLean in is one of your assistants. I think I think he's he's not a guy I trust as the head coach, but I think he's sort of like a Dave Cameron, but in that he's got a lot of experience, been around the game forever. I could see him fitting in well with the staff here. Yeah, that could work. I think because Tippett has familiarity with Gullitson and or with uh, Trilliving and Maloney, I could also see honestly. Um, I could see Tippett coming in as the associate coach next year if he doesn't get the head coach job. That's a possibility as well. Get him something. Get him on a team. And if someone else wants to hire him as a head coach, tell him, you know what, this is something for you to do until someone wants you. Yep. So lots of lots of questions about the coach. I think the biggest thing a new coach needs is not a new system, not anything like that. I think a new coach needs to have some patience and keep their eyes open. There's whoever it is. There's a lot of times this year we started to see chemistry on a line and then Gullison would go back to an old version of that line or we'd see two guys play together and he'd be like, nope, that's working. We're not going to do that. We don't want a line that's working. So I think that... Um, you know, someone new needs to be flexible. And I also think somebody new needs to not care so much about the number of zeros in your contract or the name on the back of your jersey. If you're not playing well, you need to sit down. Yeah, it's... The Flames need a coach that has the experience and the wherewithal to be able to utilize personnel properly. And whether that's like having a player like, say, TJ Brody, who's always been a right side defender even though he's a left shot like he, he's had two spectacularly bad seasons in his career and they were when he was put over to the left side well if it didn't work the first year and then it continues to not be working the second year maybe there's a reason for that and a good coach would have realized that probably around november last year that, that, hey, this isn't working right. Let's try him back on the, the side where he's comfortable and make modifications to the lineup from there. And it's just stuff like that where, or like on the power play specifically, where you have the, all of the players basically uh, with their sticks basic force facing the boards 
so that they have to shoot from really bad angles if they do get the puck or and they can't one time the puck properly and then you wonder why the power play doesn't work because there's no shooting options and that's insanely easy to defend against like any coach at any level could defend against that and it's just lots of little detail work that this current coaching staff doesn't do and that hopefully the new coaching staff will do well Matt should we start (laughs) should we start getting out of here and get ready for the LA game yep well, we've, we're going to start something new. We know that a lot of our fans have some frustrations. A lot of you guys told us things you want us to talk about. And as the season winds down, I think there's going to be a lot to talk about in the next couple of weeks with who should stay, who should go, all those sort of things. So we're going to try something new. We've opened up a phone line. You can call in or text us. We're not going to answer, but it'll go to voicemail. And the number for our Burning Questions phone line is 587 587- Two zero zero seven one seven six, and we'll also post that on the website, on Twitter, everywhere. So call in as you're watching the games, as you're thinking about stuff, and let us know what you think of the Flames. Where are they at? What changes need to be made? Do you agree with our assessment for coaches? Who stays? Who goes next year? Let us know. And again, that phone number is five eight seven two zero zero seven one seven six, and we will read uh, some of the best texts on the air, and we'll hopefully play some of the voicemails as the seasons wind down. So it's a new way for you guys to interact with us and we'll see what you guys think of that one. We hope some people will call in. So Matt, last, last week's question was, are you going to be watching any flames games or, or what will you be doing uh, for watching flames games so far in the season? And most of our respondents said that they'd already tuned out. And most people said they hadn't watched a full game in a few weeks. So um, not really, not really, the, I think, what the Flames want right now, but it sounds like the Sea of Red isn't behind them. And even in the Anaheim game, we saw a lot of people leaving early and even the team getting booed at the end of the game. So it sounds like the Sea of Red's drying up quickly. Yeah, well, the season as it was was so underwhelming to expectations that it put a very bad taste in the Flames fans' mouth. And it's going to take a lot for especially with like the off ice arena stuff like between all of everything a lot of the flames goodwill that's been built up over the years evaporated very quickly and it's going to be tough for the team to get the fans enthusiasm back because like if the flames are waffling again next season in the early part of the year like it, it's going to be hard for the team the fans to get enthusiastic cuz uh, well we saw this team was poised to be a contender at least for home ice at the end of January and since then they've been the worst team in the NHL so it's hard to get any enthusiasm when that happens and of course there are excuses but still yeah we'll see how things go i mean we'll talk more about this in our season recap i still think the biggest uh off ice or off season story for this team this year off the ice could be the sale of the calgary flames that is a possibility i don't know how realistic but it, that could happen I think if not this year, it'll be next year. I just think that this team's not going to move forward with the ownership they have, and I think there's a lot of people in this city who would pony up to own the Calgary Flames. Yep. I'm not saying relocation. I just think we got a new ownership group who might be more friendly to spending some money, maybe on a coach, maybe on an arena, the things that need money spent on them. Yeah. So this year's, or this week's, poll question we want to know from you guys who do you think should be the next head coach of the team um this is going to be a different poll than usual we have some of the names that we talked about today and we're also going to allow you to write in your own answers so if you have a different answer someone else you want to see feel free to write them in and we'll go through those results next week as always those will be on facebook we're at fires or we're facebook.com slash fireside chat on facebook we're at fireside podcast on twitter we're now on instagram at where we are fireside chat underscore podcast and the poll will also be on our website at firesidechat.ca so matt before we leave for the week let's uh i'm almost afraid to do this but let's look ahead to the three games we've got this week the flames are on the road tonight in la 8 30 start 
Then they come home and play Columbus and Edmonton on Thursday and Saturday. Those will be the games for we re- record next. Uh, two points against Edmonton. Everything else, not so much. I'm hoping you're right, but I think Edmonton's going to come back and get their revenge after we beat them once. I think this could be a goose egg for the Flames this week. Yeah. Frankly, I think that the Flames are probably going to lose every game the rest of the way. Especially if Gaudreau doesn't come back at all or, you know, like, well, most of the team's out. So I, I think at this point the Flames tell Gaudreau take as much time as you need. I don't think they reactivate Kachuk. No, I don't think that any of the people that are off come back. So, yeah, it they're just it's gonna suck. So <laughs> we'll see. I don't see how this current forward group can score any goals with any regularity. So I don't. Yeah, it's gonna suck. <laughs> I think this could be a this time like for reminds- you guys. Yeah, this reminds me of back, like, from our first and second season of recording the show, where, like, um, so, we played hockey this week. (laughs) We call that hockey, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this could be a time for guys to step up. I think a guy like Nick Shore needs a contract next year. This could be a time for him to step up. I think this could be a time for Bennett to step up. Um, we'll see what happens. I don't know if this team's just defeated, or if there are guys say, yeah, this is our chance. Let's take it and let's run with it. Well, we'll see how they do. Then, you know, if there's any excitement, then we'll have something positive to cover next week. It sounds like you already fall asleep and the game's not even on yet. Oh, I know. I'm I'm doing my pregame warm up. You see. Okay, you got to practice your yawning for when the game comes on. Yep. Okay. Well, Matt, let's go. Let's enjoy as much as we can the LA game tonight, and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.